Our next speaker is Tom Fine, and Tom is an editor, writer, and historian of the recording and music business. He owns and operates an analog to digital transfer studio in Brewster, New York, specializing in archival transfer and preservation and private collections. He has published articles in the Ars Journal and elsewhere, and the title of Tom's presentation is the 35 millimeter record fad. Tom. Oops. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, all right, uh, thank you, thank you for coming. It's an honor to be at ARSC. This is my first time presenting here, so appreciate your patience and indulgence. Um, I want to thank, for, to start off with, two people who are here, Nick Berg and um, Lon Hendrickson, both of whom uh, have been very helpful in my research with this. <laughs> So we're going to talk about the 35 millimeter fad, and um, the word fad would indicate that there might be some hype to this. Uh, I, my suggestion is always buy the old LPs, listen to them, and you decide. We'll start off with a brief history of uh, 35 millimeter magnetic film. Uh, magnetic recording came to the United States basically to be used widely in uh, music and movie production after World War II. As we know, it was invented much earlier and widely used in Germany uh, much earlier. Um, DuPont produced a 35 millimeter uh, magnetic film and RCA produced a conversion kit for their PR-23 recorder in 1947. And by 1951, uh, both RCA and Westrix were producing uh, magnetic recorders of various um, widths for various uh, film and uh, a stripe and a full coat. We'll be talking about full coat with this. That, that's what was used uh, for making record albums. Um, and then I just wanted to point out, I found the Simpty Progress Report in 1952 uh, stated that approximately 75 percent of original production um, recording, music, scoring, and dubbing in Hollywood was done on magnetic recording equipment. I assume that includes tape and uh, magnetic film. This is uh, the first um, magnetic recorder that, or magnetic film recorder that was used um, in Hollywood. It's the, R, it's the uh, retrofit kit to the RCA uh, PR23 and uh, it just shows that um, if you look on the lower right, uh, it shows where the magnetic heads and the optical um, playback is, is located in the same chamber. So the first, the, the beginner of this fad was Everest Records. And I highly recommend that you read uh, Lon Henriksen's um, detailed history of Everest that was published in uh, Classic Record Collector. Um, but the synopsis is, Everest Records was started by a guy named Harry Belloc, who was in the uh, defense manufacturing business mainly. And he was an audiophile. He met a guy named Burt White, who was an audio engineer. And basically, they decided to get into the record business. Um, Everest lasted from uh, early 58 to about mid-1960. And they um, built a studio in Bayside, Queens, and they started out recording three-channel half-inch tape like most um, classical record uh, companies were doing at, at that time. Um, Belloc wanted to do something better. He had a background in Hollywood, so with the help of a guy named John Liverdary, they, they um, converted to uh, a 35 millimeter um, based operation. Westrex um, outfitted them, and Westrex's famous uh, engineer uh, and salesman, uh, J John Doc Frain, did a presentation and an article about um, Everest Studio for, th for the AES, and that's definitely worth reading if you're interested in this, because it gives quite a bit of technical detail about uh, the, the benefits of using film and also uh, Everest's setup. These pictures are from uh, Doc Frain's um, AES presentation, actually. No, they're from the article in the AES journal. 
Interesting thing, Everest always claimed this was customized equipment that they were using. Now, um, Nick Berg and I have done research on this, and we did find that there were, one, one thing for sure was custom built for Everest. On the, in the left picture, the middle, um, what looks like a mixing board, that's a three-channel compressor that was built for Everest. It's a portable compressor, and there, there was actually a separate Westrex model number for that. Um, some captions have listed that as, as an auxiliary mixer. It's not. It's a compressor. And it's not an equalizer either, because um, there's actually a schematic for it. It shows that it's three compressor units. Um, Everest would, would cut their discs from the 35 millimeter. And um, you know these pictures basically show their control room. Now, here's where the hype comes in, because it was a fad. Everest was, start, was very good at um, marketing. They, they took out an ad in High Fidelity magazine in December 59. Uh, showing that, you know, the purported benefits of magnetic film. They also did this on their inner sleeves. And um, interestingly, though, the bottom right picture shows many albums that were made on tape and a few albums that were made on 35 millimeter film. But they got their message out. They got these records into the marketplace. They were well reviewed. Um, they were well recorded, too, as you'll hear. However, Everest lost money and was never profitable. Belloc Instruments board shut them down in 1960. By the spring of 1961, Fine Recording, which was my father's company, acquired the studio in Bayside, Queens. The catalog, the Everest catalog, was sold to a guy named Bernie Solomon out in Hollywood. And so one thing that's confusing about Everest is you see that label used in the late 60s and early 70s for all kinds of junk that had nothing to do with these original Everest recordings. There was also repressings done by Solomon. They're the orange label ones. They're not as, they're, you know, cheap pressings, sometimes made from tape copies. Um, Sometimes made from original metal parts, from what I can gather, but uh, not as good as the original Everest LPs. Um, so for, for fine recording, this was a natural fit, because um, the operation in Manhattan was already in the sound for film business, and this was a way to acquire a lot of very good equipment at, in a very good deal. So that was done. People had noticed in the industry about how Everest had marketed this 35 millimeter, and you know there was, they got good press and they got good reviews. They just didn't sell a lot of records, and those records were expensive to make. So, needless to say, Fine Recordings clients were aware that this equipment was now bought and available. Um, the main clients that. Um, express the interest were Mercury Records, Command Records, and Cameo Parkway, and they would all go on to use this same batch of equipment. So one interesting thing is almost all of these 35 millimeter records were made basically with the same equipment and, and the same facilities and um, some of the same engineers. Uh, these are some pictures from Bayside when it was operated by Fine Recording. These pictures actually happened to be when uh, my, my dad and mom are on the uh, left, and this was when they were mixing the Civil War, um, the Civil War albums for Mercury. And um, that picture on the bottom of Ted Gossman in the machine room has um, often been used uh, and said it was when Everest, from Everest Studios. It's not, because these are all from the same contact sheet. This was all the same day when the Civil War was being mixed in, uh, I think 1962. So Mercury Living Presence went into the 35 millimeter, and um, it was quite successful for them. They they uh, they were in it for a couple of years. They sold quite a few albums, and some of the albums are still available now in the new 50 CD box set. I'll get to that in a minute. The first time the 35 millimeter was used was here in Rochester in May 1961. And Fred Fennell was doing a program of uh, Gabrielli music, and it was actually in a church here. It wasn't recorded at the Eastman School. And the, the setup and the crew um, in the Mercury session books, it says Everest equipment and crew. So it was a three mic recording, but I'm, I would bet that, that Ted Gossman ran most of the equipment because he knew how to run it. At the, you know, he was familiar with it. 
It sounds to me like they use the church microphones. I don't think they use the Shep's microphones on that recording. Um, the first, so Mercury then was, was happy enough with the results that they got that they took it to London, um, Moscow, Detroit, Minneapolis, Rochester again, and did some recording at Fine Recording Bayside. Um, also, Mercury did a record for um, Phillips after Phillips had bought Mercury in 1961, uh, the Richter playing the list with um, the London Symphony and Kondrashen. Uh, and the, of course, the 35 millimeter equipment traveled to Moscow in 1962, and it was used until the summer of 63 in London, where they ran out of film uh, the day before the last day, and that, that was it. They didn't, there were no more Mercury records made with the 35 millimeter. Some of the masters survived all the way to the early 90s when the CD reissues were made, and we still had the playback equipment, so they were. The, the, any of the CDs that have the 35 millimeter stripe across them, all or part of that CD was actually made from a 35 millimeter master, not, not a tape copy, not a three track that was run at the same time. Um, some of the Everest films survived too and Classic Records put those out. So here's some, uh, for, the, for the discography and collectors, here's some Mercury covers. The one on the upper left is the first 35 millimeter record, the Gabrielli. Notice the um, way the 35 millimeter was branded, it's pretty low key across the top. Then the, ser the next series came out, actually had a strip of um, 35 millimeter um, plastic, it was plastic film that was unperforated, it was just white print behind, and that was actually glued to the front of the record album. So if you find one of those, that's an original. Um, the back of the record is below the Byron Janus cover, and that shows Mercury's um, marketing um, and, and you know explanation of the 35 millimeter advantages. Um, the upper right is a sampler that was put out for, for record stores and dealers and radio stations. Then the Balalaika's record was made in Russia in 1962, um, actually made in Moscow. And then the, the Richter, I put the Richter on the screen just to show you there was one Phillips record that had that 35 millimeter strip across the top and that was the original issue of the Richter in the US. Um, Mercury's advertising was, was more, it was a little bit more low key than Everest. It, they definitely pushed the fact that, you know, this 35 millimeter sounds better with the plus, 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 but they were pushing their content um, as well as the technology a little bit more. And then the Civil War was, was a production. Basically, the, the Civil War was made possible by using film mixing techniques because there are, there are side-long um, music, sound effects, and uh, narration, um, basically production pieces that were made as you would, the way you'd mix a film. That um, picture that showed Ted Gossman, every machine in the machine room had something loaded on it. So probably they were doing a weaponry sequence where you'd have you know muskets and... Um, the, the rifles and cannons and, and all that, and that would be mixed into a sound montage. And it, you, you know, you could you could have done it with an eight-track tape. It was easier to do it with uh, with film in those days, if, especially if you were in the film production business. Mercury, these following two screens are the CDs that are in the 50 CD box set that were actually made from 35 millimeter masters. And now we get to our, um, the next stage was that the pop division noticed that the classical 35 millimeter had some uptake in the market. The pop division at Mercury came out with a series called Perfect Presence that was uh, made to compete with Command, basically with the Stereo Spectacular records. Um, everybody was in this now. I was just at the record stores uh, this, this week and I picked up more Stereo Spectacular records. It's unbelievable how many companies got into percussion records circa 1959, you know? <laughs> so everybody was in this. Mercury was in this. They weren't selling all that well. Well, let's take the percussion and the Stereo Spectaculars and put 35 millimeter with it, the pop division said. So they came out with the F35D series. Now, this is, this is interesting because this is the most diverse source for this 35 millimeter fad. There were records made in Hollywood at Radio Recorders, in Hollywood at um, United Recording, and in Chicago at Universal Recording. So 
those three studios, as well as fine recording, were making 35 millimeter pop records for Mercury. Um, the artists included David Car Carroll, uh, Xavier Cugat, Fred Fennell made um, three pop records for Mercury Living Presence, and these are the only Mercury Living Presence records that used more than three microphones. Um, they were, you know, multi mic done like a command record, basically. Um, Fennell Plays Cole Porter was done at Fine Recording Bayside on 35 millimeter. And these, you know, these were like command records. They had a gatefold, and they were actually more like London Phase 4 records. The whole interior was talking about this, you know, the, the 35 millimeter advantages, and some would say hype. Um, these, are so, these are some examples. The, the upper uh, left and middle are the, these were the gatefolds in these albums. So all this detail about how they did it, it's, it's reminiscent of what Phase 4 did a couple of years later. Um, so apparently Decca was paying attention. Now we see a few of the titles underneath that. Um, the Spanish Fire is interesting because that's, that's an early one with that um, 35 millimeter branding. The rest of them were more like the Fennell one. The one on the lower left is a mono one which I guess you really lose the advantage of the whole thing. If <laughs> it's, it's not really a mono spectacular. The inside still tells you where everything is, though. Yeah, so yeah that's true, yeah, because the map is inside on, on, the, on the gatefold. <laughs> so our next player in this is Command Records. Now, Command Records was, was uh, never shy about advertising anything. And um, Enoch Light's company, had, they started the stereo spectacular records with persuasive and provocative percussion and um, bongos and the Tony Matola albums, the Dick Hyman albums. These, these things sold. I mean, Command made money. They, they were a division of ABC, and these things, made, these things were profitable. So Command was a logical client for this 35 millimeter thing, because Enoch Light was always pushing the fidelity of his records, or the, I guess the sonic spectacularness. Um, and so they, they came right in. They wanted pop and, and uh, classical. And um, they had, they, right about the time they, they came out with stereo slash 35 millimeter, which was, was a hit. It was a charted record. It didn't chart as well as provocative and persuasive, but it, it charted. And, um, they got into the classical business when they signed um, the Pittsburgh Symphony and Steinberg, and this, this was very logical for them to come into a deluxe product that was recorded on 35 millimeter with very deluxe packaging, and um, it, it fit everything that Command was about. They used 35 millimeter the longest. They used it through 1968. When Enoch Light left Command and started Project 3, he initially used 35 millimeter. But from what I can tell, Project 3 wasn't recording anything on 35 millimeter after it's 1969, nothing. And I think they stopped in 1968. So when Command gets into the business, they take out a two-page ad. And there's, there's a lot of, lot of talk in there about, about 35 millimeter. Um, this, this worked, though, because this album charted. The, you know, this was a very profitable album. It was expensive to make, but it, it made money. They um, also did a two-page ad when they got into classics. And, you know, the, the centerpiece of their classical recording tech, um, technique was using the 35 millimeter. They never made money in classical music, as far as I could tell. They, the Steinberg records are, you know, if any of you have them, those are good records, performance-wise and sound-wise, but they, they never sold very well. Um, you could say the ownership didn't treat those, th that catalog very well. It, it, if it had been in, in print again, it probably would have sold more. Some of it was in print briefly by MCA in the 90s, but a lot of that was made from two-track dubs and, and the like. Um, just one more uh, command picture. The left is a dual ad that they were doing by um, 1962. And so by 1962, 35 millimeter was an established thing. It was still an advertising hook. But so for command, really their brand was tied to 35 millimeter. If you take out a full page ad, we're gonna talk about the 35 millimeter. On the right are pictures from the last recording session um, that Command Classics did in Pittsburgh in 1968. And um, the captions tell you who's in the foreground. In the, in the background near the two film machines, left sitting down is Ted Gossman, 
the young guy in the middle is Larry Dahlstrom, and the young guy on the right is Kenny Fredrickson. And if you got any of you guys that worked in the New York studio business probably knew Larry and Kenny at some point. So the, the, uh, the fad spread to a couple of other players. Cameo Parkway did release quite a few 35 millimeter records, um, mostly pop. The, the, the example we're going to hear is actually from a mono LP of an organ recording, so it's not going to tell the story, but I couldn't find a stereo LP. Um, and uh, Project 3 also did re recording. Now, there may have been others, but I don't know who they are or where they are, so anyone who knows of other 35 millimeter players, please contact me and tell me, because I'd like to write an Ars Journal article about this. It's kind of an interesting piece of history. Um, by 1970, I, I couldn't find any 35 millimeter records made by anybody. Enoch Light was actually getting into quad with, um, with uh, Project 3. He was an early player in quad, and I actually picked up a qu couple of quad Project 3 albums in the $2 bins at these record stores in Rochester. Somebody liked Enoch Light. I always find Command and Project 3 in this town. Um, the, the, the cost was the big thing. There's just, Hollywood has a business model where you can use 30, the, this expensive equipment and this expensive film stock and it, it just works in Hollywood. It doesn't work in the record business. The record business, as everybody knows, is not the most profitable thing and the profitability is variable. It's a hit and miss business. You can't be investing the kind of money it takes to make an album with 35 millimeter in something that's gonna sell a couple of hundred copies. And unfortunately, a lot of these titles did. Um, the, when Dolby NR came out, quieter tape formulations, and also for pop and rock, the recording technique is, you know, once you get to eight and 16 tracks, you're gonna use tape. You're not gonna mess with a room full of film dubbers. So it was, it was doomed, but it was an interesting fad. These, the other players, the Cameo Parkway put out these pop albums, and they also had a lot of technical detail. One thing that's funny is they, they claim their four-channel 35 millimeter. Fine Recording had no four-channel 35 millimeter equipment at that time. So I don't know where the fourth channel comes from on these records. I don't know how, this, how they made that claim. They sound like just regular stereo spectacular records. Um, but you see that they had photos of the Fine Recording machine room on the back. And that was still at Bayside. They had a smaller advertising budget, but they definitely um, you know, pushed the idea that it was on 35 millimeter film. Their whole hook was that they were pricing at a non-deluxe price. Everybody else was priced at 598. Cameo Parkway was putting out gatefold stereo spectacular albums at 398. Project 3 was, um, Enoch Light always you know, wanted to do things high class, so you know, he would, on the records that he made with 35 millimeter, he had a lot of marketing text and, uh, you know, he, he didn't cheap out, these weren't, these weren't cheap records, they were similar to Command and how they were produced, you know, the good session players, you know, top flight um, engineering, you know, not, not um, squeezing too much in the time, uh, in the sessions and everything, good arranging, the usual, the usual thing. If you like this kind of music, Enoch Light's stuff is the Cadillac of it. Um, there was a popular science article done in 1967, how, a, how an LP record is made, that uh, covered a, an Enoch Light session at Fine Recording. By this time, Bayside was shut down and the, the old Everest equipment was integrated into Manhattan. So you see the Manhattan machine room, you see Kenny Fredrickson operating the machines up there, and then George Piros is cutting an LP from a 35 millimeter master in the bottom picture. Now these, thir these 35 millimeter masters, the way Mercury cut records and command cut records also, they would edit in three track 35 millimeter and then cut the LP directly from, they'd do a live three to two mix and cut the LP from that. The Mercury CDs were done the same way, the Everest CDs were, were done the same way. Um, you know, the ones that were done out by Classic Records at Bernie Grunman's place. And in fact, they also did DVD audio discs that had all three channels separate. Um, but also, Luckily, Command and Mercury would always run a two-track tape at the same time, capturing that live three-to-two mix. 
And that's lucky because a lot of 35 millimeter masters have been lost or, or not playable anymore. So now we get, this is the R topic, now we get into preservation. These things don't hold up well over time. Uh, Nick can probably tell you a, a day of horror stories about 35 millimeter mag film. Uh, it's thick, it's on acetate base, a lot of the, the stuff, the polyester base came out after most of these records were made. It's just, it suffers shrinkage, it suffers vinegar syndrome, record companies don't manage their vaults well, um, and so some were even ordered destroyed. Um, that's why there's very few command masters left. And uh, some Mercury did survive and were, were reissued, same with Everest, but the th as far as I can tell, very few command masters exist anymore, and those that exist are not playable. And I, there's been talk on the ARSC list about the terrible shape the Everest masters are in right now. They're just, they, the, they don't hold up. This is what happens. Um, Nick was kind enough to send me this photo, so I'll use his description. Uh, a mix of all sorts of problems. The dimples are caused by uneven shrinkage and breaking of the acetate polymer chains. The white is hardened plasticizer crystals that must be cleaned off. Uh, under, under the old film is a new piece of film, so you can see the amount of shrinkage. So that's a shadow on the bottom, but what you're seeing is he's lined up the bottom edges, and so that's how much the, the old 1960s film has shrunk. It's, it's 33 millimeters. You can't even put it on a, on a 35 millimeter transport anymore. Um, so, do we have five minutes, uh, Sarah? Can we listen to some music? It's literally five minutes. Oh, all right. So, let, we'll listen to some music. Um, the first track is, is th this is a mashup. I learned what a uh, remix was the other day, so, th so I I'm pretty confident this is what you call a mashup. Um, segments one through three are Everest. Notice in segment two that an airplane pla passes over the studio. That was a problem with the Queen's studio. It did not have good isolation. And the train, you had to stop when the train went by. Um, Four through six are Mercury, segment seven is Command, and segment eight, I'm sorry, it's from a mono LP, it's Cameo. And uh, if you could play track one, please. Yeah. 
Okay, so that, the classical, one comment I should make is I didn't try to um, monkey with the levels. These are, these were all played back at the same level and then I just normalized the, the end result to the loudest. So, um, you could see that uh, the, the first two Everest segments, the, they, they cut plenty loud on their vinyl, so they had good, good signal to noise ratio. The third Everest segment was from one of the um, Bernie Solomon pressings, and it, it doesn't do it justice. It's just, it's just a, not a good sounding record. Same with the Cameo. The Mercuries were from the LP sampler, the in-store sampler, so um, they, that, that's a pretty loud uh, side, I have to say. They kept it to, to, I think, 12 minutes, and it's pretty loud. Um, so let's listen to some pop. These are, these are all from the Project 3 and the Command are from original LPs. The, three, the four Mercuries are from their 35 millimeter pop sampler, but that was a regular length album, so it, that's about the same level that you'd get on their records. One thing about these, kind of, these records is the pop records would always be 12 to 15 minutes per side and super loud. So, uh, you know, that's part of the stereo spectacular thing. So let's play number two, please. <laughs> millimeter really sound better. You can find these LPs around. They're, they're in two dollar record bins in this town. Buy a few and listen to them. See what you think. Um, you know, the, the music's always fun, I find, especially with these pop records. Um, and, you know, it was, it was an interesting thing. It, it, there were, some people were very successful at it. I would say um, Mercury was successful at it with the classical records. Command was extremely successful at it financially. And, uh, Enoch Light was successful with Project 3. I think he got into multi-track recording and, and moved toward quad very early in the game. And, you know, the 35 millimeter just doesn't work for that. It's much better to... And also, he switched to working at A&R Studios, and they were, much, they were more multi-track tape-oriented. So, that's, that's it. Thank you very much.